Hey guys, welcome back. So this is part two on the storm responder generator. If you missed part one, I'll link to it up above and down in the description. Anyway, to catch you up real quick, this one I only paid $100 for. The engine ran out of oil and the connecting rod blew. So my hope was I could rebuild that engine. A lot of times when the connecting rod breaks, it punches a hole in the side of the block. And this one survived. There is absolutely no damage to this side. So I took the engine apart, honed the cylinder for about 30 seconds, and things cleaned up really well. So this was looking like a good candidate for a rebuild, at least until I noticed the damage right up here at the bottom of the cylinder. There is a chunk missing. So that wasn't sitting well with me. I didn't want to fix this engine and sell it to someone as a good running engine when I know there is some internal damage. So I took a look online at engines available in my area and came up with this. This is an 11 horse Briggs Vanguard engine. This is a commercial grade engine and a major upgrade in quality from the engine that was on there. Now this was supposed to be a good running engine and obviously that wasn't the case. I started it up and I heard a very loud knock. So my assumption was it had a bad connecting rod. And what I found instead was that the counterbalancer was out of time by one tooth. And because of that, the weight on the counterbalancer was making contact with the weight on the crankshaft. And that's all that noise was. So that is an easy fix. The issue's already been corrected and this is ready to be reassembled. The only thing holding me back was the fact that I did not have a gasket for the crankcase cover or for the engine head. So I'm still waiting on this one, but I did receive this today. So that should be enough to get going on this. So let me get you set up a little bit better and we'll start putting this together. Just adding a bit of assembly lube to these journals. These I did wipe clean. The rest of the engine I did not touch, so that should already be pre-oiled. The service manual does not say to use Loctite on these crankcase bolts. This one though does show a little bit of evidence of it. So I am gonna use a bit of Loctite to hold these in place. So the guy before me who messed up the timing also did not torque these bolts down. They were very loose. And I'm just realizing now that I'm missing one of the bolts that go down there. So I did manage to locate a bolt that should work just fine. It is a little longer, I'd say a quarter inch longer. And I think that is an issue down there because it's not a through hole. The one up here is though. So I'm gonna move this bolt down to there and put this one in the top left and I think we'll be okay.
This gets torqued to 175 inch pounds. I'm going to bring it up halfway first and then finish it off. Make sure you put this on the right way. I mean, technically it'll mount either way, but it's only gonna spark correctly like this. It actually says this side out, and on the other side it says cylinder side. So let's plug in the kill wire. And then we'll attach this and use a business card to space it to 10 thousandths of an inch. And just rotate the engine until the magnet is under the ignition coil. And then just loosen it up. The magnet will pull it in and you'll be at 10 thousandths of an inch. And rotate the engine at least once around. Make sure there's no contact with the flywheel. And it looks like we're good. It is the next day, and unfortunately, the head gasket did not show up. It is delayed. It'll be here tomorrow. You know, that said, there still are a couple things we can do. First off, we are missing another bolt on the crankcase cover, so we'll get that replaced, and we can install the bell housing.
The bolts for the bell housing do need Loctite. I'm gonna test fit it though. A lot of times these bolts are actually too long on other engines. You know, my hope is since this is a Briggs that maybe we don't need to cut these bolts down. So close. That bolt though, it is bottomed out and the bell housing is not secure. So I do need to shave a little bit off the length of the bolt. Now, you might be wondering why I just don't put a washer behind there. And the answer is these are low profile bolts for a reason. If I put a washer there, it's gonna raise the height just a bit. And that is enough to interfere with the fan on the rotor and it will actually make contact. So yeah, we have to stick with these. We just need to shorten them a little bit. So the key here is to add this nut, because when you cut it, you are gonna damage the threads and the nut can be used to clean them up. Now it actually looks like the threads might be a little damaged already, or maybe it's just a bit of Loctite that's left on there. Yeah, that's all it is. Three more to go. Give this another try. Yeah, much better. I do not have an official torque spec on these. I do usually torque them to 20 foot pounds. New head gasket finally showed up today. So let's 
just degrease the mating surfaces and get this thing back together. These are just locating pins, helps keep the gasket straight and holds the head in place. The service manual says to bring this up to 35 foot-pounds in three increments. So I'm going to start at about 120 inch-pounds. That'll bring it up a bit. And then finally, the 35 foot-pounds. There we go. We get these push rods back in and then we'll adjust the valves. It should be between four and six thousandths of an inch. Going to rotate the engine. I want to make sure the push rods are in their spot. And this one might be a little off. Nope, we're good. Going to rotate the engine until the exhaust is open and I'll set the clearance on the intake. And once that is set, I rotate the engine again to open the intake and set the exhaust. I want it to be at about 5,000s. Right now the 5,000s fits without any drag. Let's check an eight. An eight does not fit. How about a six? Six fits. Let's check a seven. And a seven fits as well. So right now we're between seven and eight thousandths of an inch. Should be less than six, greater than four. So let's make that adjustment. I think that's good. Five fits with a bit of drag. Six does not fit. Exhaust valve definitely seems a bit looser. Let's check an eight. An eight fits. How about a nine? Yep. 10? 
No. So it's in between a 9 and a 10. Let's bring that down to 5. Five fits and a six dozen. Perfect. I just rotated the engine a few times, double checked the clearance, and was still right at five thousandths on each valve. So I think we're done in here. Just a bit of WD-40 should take care of this grease. The governor rod needs to be attached before installing the carburetor. Then we'll get this adjustment plate here for the choke and also the Adjustment for the governor spring goes on top. 
We already have the old gasket there, so I'm going to reuse that. I believe the spring was on the inner hole here. Going to back the spring tension off a bit. This actually has a fully adjustable throttle. These two set screws lock it in place once you hit 61 and a half hertz. There's really no reason to be moving this. But for now, I'm going to bring this set screw back, which should allow me to take tension off and slow the engine down. So I'm going to start it with a bit less tension. And then we can always bring it up to speed once the engine's running.
So what do you think? It's all fueled up, the counterbalancer's in time, and there's oil in the engine. And so far, none of it's leaking out. So let's get it started and see how that engine sounds. All right, let's give this a try. I strapped the wood in, so hopefully it won't fall out like last time I tried starting this. So we got the ignition on, choke on, and I got it at low speed. So let's see what we get here. All right, not too bad. It started right up and the engine sounds good. So I think we're ready to move on here and get the power head attached to this engine. Now, if you remember the last video, that was my main concern was A, was the engine gonna fit in the frame? And B, is the power head gonna fit? Because the crankshaft exits this engine an inch higher and this crankcase is an inch longer. So that stator is gonna be right up against the end here. And it's also gonna be really close to that control panel. You know, I think it's gonna work. The engine mounts, I did move back about three quarters of an inch. And most likely we're gonna to have to make some adjustments down there. So let's get the rotor and the stator installed and see if it fits. So now is as good a time as any to clean up these slip rings. You can use an eraser. It's probably the safest thing to do. It does not scratch up the slip rings. I usually use Scotch-Brite. They do leave some fine scratches, which I haven't had an issue with. But if you want to be safe, I think the eraser is the safest option. But I think I'm going to use the tried and true. And be careful not to knock the wires that connect to the slip rings. They are easy to break. Another little trick I like to do here is add some electrical tape to build a shoulder because this is the smaller bolt size. It's eight millimeter diameter bolt. And the larger ones that are 10 millimeters fit in the shaft nice and tight, but the eight is quite loose. And when you tighten it up, it always goes to one side. So if you build a little shoulder, then it goes in pretty straight. And 
see the play is all taken out now. So the bolt going nice and straight, that way when you torque it down, you know you're getting an accurate number. I didn't pull this recoil off just to clean it. I'm going to use the nut on the flywheel to hold the engine still. So that way I can torque down on the rotor. All right, let's see if this thing's gonna fit. It's gonna be close. It fits, only just though. If you look down at the end here, I mean, this is my big concern is that there's not a lot of room from the end of the stator to this piece right here. And we still need to get this cover on. And if you look at the cutout for the control panel and the top of the stator, the stator is now above where the control panel goes in. So I wouldn't say we're home free yet, but let's see if this end cover fits. Still, and it does. And the control panel, it is tapered on the top and bottom, so we have a chance. And it mostly fits, doesn't quite go all the way in. And if you look here, you can see why. Top of the stator is hitting the bottom of the control panel. So we're, we're really close. I think we need about a quarter inch clearance to get this to fit properly. And we already have that. If you look at the length of the stator, we have just a quarter of an inch here. So we're okay in that direction, but up here, that is the issue. You know, that said, I don't think it's gonna be an issue because this is just a random block of wood I threw under there. I just measured from the top of this to the top of the rail, and it's about 2.1 inches. And I'm gonna use this to mount the stator. This is the original mount right here with an automotive stud and a coupler. And that measures only at 1.9 inches. So that's gonna give us about quarter of an inch clearance up there. So I think we'll be okay, but let's get these mounted and just make sure. I guess the other concern is, are we gonna to have to drill another mounting hole? Because even though we moved the, the mounts up front, I could only move it three quarters of an inch and I needed an inch. 
But it looks like it is going to be really close. Looks like it's going to work. Yeah, plenty of clearance now. So I think, I think we're good to go. I mean, even though the stator is down almost a quarter of an inch from where it was, things still look pretty level. So I, I would say we're good to go. Now these mounts, they did go in the existing holes, but as feared, they are stressed a little bit. You can tell the alignment is slightly off. Don't think it's the end of the world, but I think I might jack it up again and just elongate the hole a little bit to relieve a bit of that tension. Just removed one of the engine bolts and I'm going to loosen the other. That way I can kind of pivot the stator end out of the way so I can get better access to that rail. I think that's about all I dare do. Just use a bit of Loctite to make sure this coupler stays on. Let's finish torquing the stator up and then I want to turn the engine over and just make sure there's no contact between the rotor and the stator.
So I pulled the spark plug and I've got that starter recoil back on. So I'm just gonna pull the engine over, just make sure nothing is binding up. You know, I wanna make sure the fan is not hitting the bolts and that the rotor and the stator have proper clearance. Otherwise, if there's scraping or binding, you don't wanna start the engine because you're gonna destroy the power head. All right, let's give this a try. Perfect. All right, this power head, it's very simple to wire up. These are the only wires you have to connect. And this is the DPE winding, it's AC in. So it doesn't really matter which terminal you put them on. But what's more important is how you put the brushes in because the bridge rectifier is gonna convert this to DC out to the brushes. One brush is positive and the other one's negative. And although technically you can install them either way, there's nothing to stop you. If you do it the wrong way, then positive and negative will be reversed. You're not gonna damage the rotor, but this is not gonna power up if you do it backwards, which right now it is. This tab has to be facing in. So I'm gonna reconnect this with the red wire on the top, because that is how it came off. And it shouldn't matter. Now this connection is very loose. So we need to tighten that up. Let's see, this one is nice and tight. So we'll just give that a little squeeze. That might have been too much. Let's see. Now, this is going to be good, nice and snug, which is how you want it. The blue one's good as well. So we'll put the tab on the inside. And just don't force these because the brushes, you could break them. And usually brushes are dirt cheap for most generators. This one, it has the bridge rectifier and it costs quite a bit more than usual brushes. And don't use any power tools down here. All these bolts, they strip out extremely easily. You know, even a socket and a ratchet is too much. So if you do use something like that, go easy. Because the aluminum strips out with very little effort. I know it'll come down fine from the top. Just wanna to make sure it can be done this way. It's kind of a hassle if you have to pull the tank. Anytime you wanna check the brushes. Almost there.
So I think I'm pretty much ready to go here. I've got the drop light plugged in and turned on, the kilowatt and space heater on standby. And this time I'm gonna run it connected to the test tank. So I'm not gonna to have to worry about refueling it. So the plan is just to get it started, we'll get the engine speed roughly to 61 and a half hertz, put a 1500 watt load on it and see how it does. I love these Vanguard engines. They're easy to start, they sound good, and even the carb is running the engine pretty well. You know, it did surge a bit when the engine was cold once I turned that choke off, but it seemed to work itself out. Anyway, more importantly, we have output. That light came right on. You know, I bumped the throttle to bring the engine speed up, overshot a bit to 63 and a half hertz. So we'll fine tune that later. Uh, the voltage was also high at 136 volts. Now. This one doesn't have an AVR, so the voltage is tied to the engine speed. So when I bring that speed down, the voltage should come down as well. That said, since there's no AVR, the voltage will always be high without a load and it will be low under a full load. So yeah, that's kind of the nature of the beast with this one. Anyway, I put 1500 watts on, the engine didn't even notice, doubled it to 3000 watts and same thing. The engine kept going without straining at all. So yeah, I'd say there's plenty of power in this engine. So I think the plan is just to get the heat shield on, we'll get the tank on, I'm gonna bring it outside. I'm gonna load it as close to the max as possible of 5,500 watts. We'll check out the THD and see what the sine wave looks like. So let's finish this up.
So I just dropped the tank in to test fit it and noticed a couple issues here. I guess first, the fuel line might be a little short. So I'll put a longer line on, that's not a big deal. The bigger issue is the actual fuel valve. It's hitting right there. So right now the fuel valve is turned on, but I can't actually turn it off because that little piece that hangs down is just catching the lip right here. So I've already cut a little bit off. I'm gonna trim it a little higher and that should give just enough clearance, hopefully to operate that fuel valve. Perfect. You've got to be careful removing the fuel line on a tank that's made out of plastic with this rubber bushing. You can actually just pull this fuel petcock right out. Uh, this bushing seems to be in good shape. So I'm not too worried about it, but I do have to go easy on it or I could cause some damage. It's pretty windy today, so I apologize if that noise is picked up by the microphone. Anyway, pretty much ready to go here. I've got 6,000 watts of space heaters on standby. Granted, this is only a 5,500 watt generator, so it might trip the circuit breaker. We'll start without a load. We'll double check the voltage, the hertz, the harmonic distortion, and get a look at the sine wave. Although I'll bring it up to 3,000 watts, we'll do the same checks. 5,000 watts, and then if everything goes well, I'll bring it up to 6,000 watts and see how it does. And I almost forgot, my son added a little bubble light. That's maybe three or four watts.
Got to say, I'm impressed with this setup. This engine is easy to start. It's been starting on the first pull consistently and no exception this time. You know, once running, I set the engine speed this time using the set screws. So now the throttle lever is locked in place right at 61 and a half hertz. And at that engine speed, we're at 130 volts, about 7% total harmonic distortion. I then put 3000 watts on it and everything held just fine. I think the engine was at 60 hertz. We were at, I think, 118 volts. The THD, though, was only at 9%, and that is the lowest I have ever seen on this type of generator, a brushed generator. I then brought it up to 5,000 watts. Not much changed. The engine and voltage held just fine. The THD stayed fairly steady as well, and then I overloaded it to 6,000 watts. The circuit breaker did not trip. The engine speed held at 59 and a half hertz and the voltage was low. It was at 110 volts, but that is typical for this type of setup without an AVR. You get about a 20 volt swing from full load and no load. And that's exactly what we saw. And the most impressive thing was this bubble light. It bubbled for six minutes after that generator shut down. Anyway, I've taken this one as far as I can. There were a few twists and turns. I'm glad that engine came back because it is a nice engine. And this combination is a good one. Those power heads rarely fail and neither do those engines. So I think this setup will last for a very long time. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching. Can't believe it's still bubbling.